The first book of Samuel, session 65. We proceed to chapter 29. David providently saved. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Afik, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Yisrael. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his 600 men <laughs> passed on in the Riri ward with Achish. Then said the princes of the Philistines, What are these Hebrews doing here? Are you crazy, King Achish? We are fighting against the Hebrews. Now you've got 601 Hebrew men right next to you. And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Don't stress, man. Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel? But him who's been the servant of Saul all these years, and I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. So David has behaved himself very wisely. Remember as he was in the time when Saul wanted to kill him? David behaved himself very wisely in the eyes of Saul and in the eyes of all of Israel and in the eyes of Samuel and in the eyes of God. And here we see so beautifully, even when Samuel goes into the enemy territory, he's behaving himself um, according to how a believer of Yahuwah should behave. He's been promoted already, you know, to be the right hand side of the king himself. Makes me think about Joseph. Wherever he went, he was just promoted. And he always got favor in the eyes of everyone. Although it was going rough and tough with him. And that's how we should be, no matter where we are. And that's how we should be, no matter where we are. Whether we are in church, or we are in exile, <laughs> or running away, hiding in a cave, or in a difficult situation, we need to carry the character that Yahuwah has built into us everywhere we go, whether it's in good places or in bad places. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him, angry. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place, which you have appointed him. Let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? So what are the princes of the Philistines telling Achish? They are saying, send David back to the town that you've given him. Send David back to the town that you've given him. Um, because if he's going to come down into battle with us, then maybe this is the, his opportunity to reconcile, to make right with his king, King Saul, by proving to King Saul how loyal he is. By while he's uh, pretending to fight with us, he's going to kill us all and give us in the hand of all the Hebrews. So we are thinking that this man is going to be a thorn in our sights, a spy in our midst. He's going to betray us. Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, singing, Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David. So remember, the whole world at that stage knew about David. David was a world well-known figure. Yeah, I'm not sure China, not sure China existed yet. I, I don't know. Maybe, um, you know, the the spreading of the nations, you know, has has been done by that time already. But the the central world, they where everything was happening, you know, the whole region knew about David. David slew the men in his ten thousands, and how isn't it amazing how the Philistines even knew? What songs were sang to David in the streets of Jerusalem? How even that legend uh, became well known to everybody. So they are saying, a man with this kind of reputation, do you really think he's going to fight for you? Don't you think he's going to be loyal to his king? And then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as you who are lives, you has been upright, and you're going out, and your coming in with me in the host is very good in my sight.
for I have not for I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming unto me unto this day nevertheless the Lord's favor thee not okay so what does this mean Achish is calling David and just like we saw when David was going um, out and coming in before Israel um, behaving himself in a godly manner more than a godly manner you know not every Hebrew man would have offered up their life and be so courageous and heroic to go in and kill ten thousands and go in and kill Goliath and come out and be humble and play the harp after he has been um, uh, it, it has been sung about him he is ten times bigger than Saul then he's still humble enough to go, go and play harp for Saul so even now the irritation because David's going in and coming out before the enemy's host is just as exemplary just as good the king says he he hasn't seen any evil nothing that David has d done wrong everything David has done was good in his sight unfortunately having said all that the princes of the Philistines you know the other lords of the Philistines against whom if you remember the book of Judges and Joshua how many times were there five lords of the Philistines that was defeated and that represented the, the enemy um, but these lords are not trusting David so lacquer and um, you know I have to be honest at the end of the day none of the lords of this earth or the kings of this world or the rulers of the air of the principalities of the kingdom of darkness David is representing that he has been loyal um, as long as he has been with King Achish this far wherefore now return and go in peace that you displease not the lords of the Philistines so David said unto Achish so David said to Achish but what have I done and what have you found in your servant so long as I have been with you unto this day that I may not go fight against the enemies of my Lord the King so David wants to know why can't he fight with the Philistines against the Hebrews and Achish answered and said to David I know that you are good in my sight as an angel of God <laughs> well wow. how many how many people has been compared to a real angel of Yahuwah you are as if an angel of um, I think this is Elohim not Yahuwah in the Hebrew because Achish you know I don't think he knew Yahuwah at all he just knew he just knew that it was oh that God of the Hebrews um, and then if you go into the Hebrew it does say Elohim so what Elohim he was talking about his own Elohim or David's Elohim who knows but he's compared to an angel of you who are you've been so good you were an angel notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said he will not go up with us into battle wherefore now rise up early in the morning with your with with thy master's servants that are come with thee and as soon as you be up early in the morning and have light then depart so David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines and the Philistines went up to Israel so all this sounds quite normal you know the Lords of the Philistines doesn't like the fact that David a Hebrew is going to fight with them against his own people it just makes a lot of sense but what is deeper what is really happening here because the more Achish um, happening here because the more Achish um, witnessed about David eventually he could have convinced the other Philistine kings oh, don't stress David is on our side he has been hunted down like an animal by this King Saul of the Hebrew nation so he's now loyal to us and he's an amazing fighter you yourself remember that it has been sung about him that he has killed his ten thousands so let this warrior of warriors fight with us and then what would have happened how difficult would it have been for David who now has a friend in his enemy King Achish you know he's, he's become sort of loyal to him um, he has made commitments to him uh, King Achish is looking well after David you know he's giving him a place to stay he's giving him um, peace he's giving him protection 
So there, there is a, a measure of loyalty between them. There, there is a, a measure of loyalty between them. So David on the one side has King Achish, and on the other side he has King Saul, whom he loves with all his heart, who is a bigger enemy to him, although he is it's, he's like family. They've got Abraham as their forefather. Um, also, although they like family, King Saul from his own nation is a bigger enemy to him than King Achish from the Philistines. You know, somebody that worships Yahuwah with him is a bigger enemy to him than somebody who worships an idol. But still, it is King Saul, and David loves King Saul, and David loves Israel. So in front of him will be his own people, Israel. At the back of him will be his new friends, the Philistines. What to do? You know, how, how difficult would this have been for David? So God decided to step in. So God decided to step in. God decides to make it happen that the fear the Philistine kings had in their hearts were not satisfied by King Achish. And that that fear inside of them against David caused them to send David home. Yahuwah saved David that day from having to choose between his loyalty to King Achish and to King Saul, from having to fight with a Philistine enemy against his own people, Israel, for future reference, where Israel could say, remember how David fought against us, our, his own brothers, at the battle at Yisrael. So, Yahuwah, with all his grace and mercy, saved David from that difficult choice that specific day and then David goes back you know now he goes home and to do something constructive while the battle between the Philistines and Israel is happening at the valley of Yisrael chapter 30 verse 1 and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklach on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklach and smitten Ziklach and burned it with fire. So remember in the previous um, chapter, you know, the, the chapter before that, chapter 27, um, King Achish gave Ziklach to David as a town where he can live. Now, the Amalekites, for some reason, probably knew that David and all his 600 men are not going to be in Ziklach. And all the other Philistines are not going to be around because they are fighting against Israel. So the Amalekites, typical hyenas that they are, took the opportunity and in verse 2, they have taken the women captives and were therein, all the women that were in the city. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So how amazing. How amazing the Amalekites against David stealing the woman. And can you imagine how David and his men felt as they came riding onto Ziklach and they see the fire and the smoke coming out of the city. Let us take one step back now. Let us go back to where David said to King Achish, but what have I done? Remember, how you felt many times when people showed no trust in you. You feel offended. You know, what is happening here? I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be sent home. I want to fight in battle. I deserve this. I don't deserve to be sent home. I want to fight in battle with you. I have proven myself to you over and over again. What bulldust is this now? I don't want to be treated like this. All right. But God is teaching us very Something very, very important here. Even when things happen that might cause us offense or embarrassment or ridicule or we may feel not worthy, God is busy with something bigger. And although it looked like God was only saving David from having to choose between Achish and King Saul and having to fight against his own brothers, there's even this bigger picture. If Yahuwah didn't cause David to be sent home, 
then the Amalekites would have taken um, all the women of Ziklach, all of the, wi the wives of David and his 600 men, as well as all their daughters. They would have taken them very far away. But now David came home sooner because God caused the, um, uh, the Philistines to send him home. And now he was able to catch the Amalekites sooner and rescue the women sooner. If they had been part of the battle with Israel and the Amalekites had opportunity to rape and maybe start killing all these women or raping them and making them pregnant with Amalekite children, it would have been a lost case. It would have been so much worse. So trust in God. Even if you feel offended, David, even if you feel ridiculed by the five Philistine lords, even if you feel they don't recognize how loyal you have been to King Achish, even if you feel offended and unjustified, there's always a bigger purpose. And just keep on trusting God. Even as you trusted him while you were hiding in the cave, as you were running through the wilderness, as you were burning in the wilderness of Ziph, and as you are here now being disregarded by the Philistine kings, trust in Yahuwah and do where Yahuwah leads you. Where the doors open, go there. Where the doors are closing, accept that. Because sometimes, although it, it looks and feels horrible to you, God is busy with a bigger thing. You have no idea. If you're going to fight against this, then when you come home, your city is destroyed and your women are far, far, far away gone. But if you go with the stuff that's happening, according to how God actually wants your life to work out, whether for the good or for bad, whether good for you or bad for you, it doesn't matter because there's a bigger picture there's a greater purpose that we need to start realizing. And now David comes home and the bride, the woman, all the females has been taken into captivity by the hyenas, the Amalekites. Like, um, you know, I, I always think about the demons as hyenas. They always come and bite you from the back. Bite, bite, bite from the back. How the dark forces are trying to steal the bride, the church away also from David. King, the son of David, the shepherd King Yeshua. So, let's have a bit of a deeper look. We have discussed Amalek quite in detail already. And Amalek are the descendants of Esau, right? So remember Jacob and Esau? Um, Esau hated Jacob, right? So remember Jacob and Esau? Um, Esau hated Jacob. Jacob's name changed to Israel. The descendants of Jacob is Israel. And the descendants of Esau hates Israel. So the Amalekites hates Israel, like Satan hates Israel, like Satan hates Yahuwah. So the Amalekites are a representation of their master, the idol Dachon and Baal and Molech and all these demons they are worshipping that are all just manifestations of Satan himself. They are representing the enemies of God and God's kingdom. So in this representation of the enemy of Yahuwah himself, physically the enemy of Israel, we can see how Satan is always busy with this one thing, trying to steal the bride away from Yahuwah. The enemy that walks around and wants to be the one that's worshipped, and therefore he needs to steal the bride. He stole Judah, he stole Ephraim, I hope you really know what that means. And that's how Judah and Ephraim, you know, <laughs> became part of the horde of Babylon system. And it's out of Babylon we have to come to be the true bride. And it's the true bride that is like Abigail that has left Nabal, the, the bad system, and has come over, has crossed over to David, the Hebrew uh, shepherd king. So... Abigail, for me, represents, in a sense, not the whoring bride that still has to come back, that still has to be rescued, but the true bride that David, um, symbolizing Yeshua, 
must come and rescue when he comes back. Those who really endure and stay loyal to the son of David. So David and David. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Huh. Have you ever cried so long and so hard and so much that you could not cry any more, but you felt like crying? And you started making the noise of crying, but the tears didn't, didn't want to come because you were dehydrated. You had no more strength. I think after Yeshua spent the time in Gethsemane, <clears throat> when he was sweating blood, when he was crying tears, I think he was dry. He was so dried up. He had nothing more to cry. He was cried out for his bride, of which he the bitter cup in her place. Like David is now crying his eyes out for his bride and children that has been taken. As the Bible says, God is crying and begging his children to hear him and come back to him. But because of their disobedience, they are sent into exile with hooks in their noses. They are led into captivity. And God is longing for his children. Like a mother hen is longing to gather her chickens under her wings, like a shepherd is longing to find his lost sheep. David cried until he had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives as, as well, Ahi Noam and Abigail. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was so grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in Yahuwah, his God. And here I want to tell you that if you start praying and using the Psalms, as I said to you before, no matter what you are going through, as you are starting to read the Psalms aloud as if they are your own prayers, you are going to find this word, but, so many times. My enemies rule over me, but you are my God. I am distressed in my soul, but I delight myself in you. The people want to stone me. I have no more power myself. I've cried myself to death for my wife and children. But now my own men, with all their heartache, are blaming me. And they want to stone me, but... I am going to encourage myself in you, Yik, or blaming me, and they want to stone me. But I am going to encourage myself in you, Yahuwah. I'm going to fall down before you, Yahuwah. I have just been sent out of battle. I've just been offended and disgraced in the eyes of everyone on the battlefield by the Philistine lords. And now I come to my city where I was supposed to find refuge, and it is a disaster. And my wife and children are gone, and I'm at the point of being stoned to death. I fall down before you, my Lord, my Master, my God, and I trust you. I'm going to find my encouragement in my God. I'm going to look for my answer from you. So David decided to call the priest Abiatar. Instead of um, starting to scream and shut my fault, I have done nothing wrong. I have been with you in battle. Why are you blaming me? Why do you want to kill me? Why do you want to stone me? Instead of starting to defend himself, instead of fighting with his own brothers who are also sad for their wives, instead of, t of trying to prove his own innocence, he decides to go and spend time with God. And this is why the life of David is such an example to us. How many times did he find his encouragement in the wilderness in his God? What beautiful psalms did he write while he was running away from Saul? And even now in, in this a moment of biggest distress, he could have 
just like he tried to defend himself against King Achish. But what did I do wrong? Why are you sending me home? You know, he could have done the same against his own brothers now. But what did I do wrong? Why did you So David said to Abiatar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray you, bring me here the effort. And Abiatar brought thither the effort to David. Now remember the effort, the, um, the breastplate of the priest with the 12 stones that represents all of Israel and also the, the two shoulder stones that represents the two houses. And this is how um, somehow in the mystery with the Tumim and the Urim, um, the priests were able to, um, let's call it divination. We spoke about divination yesterday. Divine supernaturally from Yahuwah Almighty, who will speak through his priests, who are not a demon who speaks through familiar spirits. So it's not really divination. It's prophecy. God speaking through the, the priest or the prophet. It's the Almighty God himself, his voice. So, self, his voice. So, David inquired of Yahuwah, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And Yahuwah answered him, Pursue after them, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail you will recover everything. Every human being, every son, every daughter, every woman, every piece of gold, every donkey, every sheep, everything they've stolen, you will recover. You know, if you think about it, there were some time for the Amalekites to start, you know, killing some of the animals and raping some of the women. And yet God preserved everything for the beloved David. Just like if the enemy, <clears throat> let me um, try to say it in a way that will not make me sound crazy. Try to say it in a way that will not make me sound crazy. Even if the enemy will abduct God's people in the end days, God will, now I must be very careful. Now I need to be very careful. Because I have spent a lot of time in prayer before Yahuwah about this as well. What if the enemy captures any of your saints in the end days that hasn't taken the mark of the beast? That hasn't allowed any of the genetic manipulation inside their own bodies. That hasn't allowed any of the artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biometrics inside their bodies. What if the enemy, like the Amalekites, will abduct or take prisoner your people and start raping them in the prisons? By raping, I mean by your people with these things that they do not want to be injected with. Just like the Amalekites who are raping the Hebrew women are ejaculating, they are injecting the women with the seed of the serpent that they don't want inside of them. It's the same concept. And that's why I'm saying I need to be careful. Because I have heard and understood how Yahuwah answered me when I pray to him and I open the word he answers me even if it takes a couple of days and then when I bring all the stuff that he gave me to read together it's like I get this bigger picture so if this is the bigger picture because he promised me he in the word is not a man that he can lie and he promised me all, all the cycles of righteousness in Scripture, all the examples from the Old Testament, from the law and the prophets, all the testimony of Yeshua in Moses and the prophets are as an example for us upon whom the ends of the earth has come, says Daniel and um, David and Moses, and confirms Yeshua and um, Saul. Everything that happened to our forefathers has been written down as an example for us upon whom the end of the ages has come. Daniel, your people will go through tribulation 
and it will make them white, it will purify and purge them. Although they will fall by the sword and by famine and by persecution and by imprisonment. But their falling is to purify them. Because it is a falling is to purify them. Because it is appointed for the end times. It is written for a time that is yet to happen in the future. Daniel 11. So if all these examples are written down for us to prepare for the end day final cycle of righteousness. And if we really are the Abigails who are made free from the foolish Nabals and bring offerings and ourselves to King David. And now you understand the Messianic prophecies I'm speaking about. Then we stand the chance in the end day to be carried away in captivity by the descendants of Esau, the Amalekites working for the serpent, stealing even the end day real what I see. What I see is the bazaar. I'm going to show you now. This is, this is unbelievably ridiculous. How true and how prophetic and how amazing the word is. Because God said, without fail, you will recover them all. They will not have been raped. They will be recovered in their good health. You will bring them all back in good health. Because I've asked him, what if we are imprisoned and we are forced and our hands are tight and we cannot fight back? How are you going to save us if we are injected and if we are genetically modified and we are, if we are taking the mark of the beast? And we can no longer be saved and we somehow become like this, these zombie, or become like this, these zombie creatures that will just um, willingly bow before the image of the beast. And this is one of the examples. So David went and the 600 men that were with him and they came to the brook Bezor. Now I'm going to stop here for today because I need to explain to you, to you this now. And we will finish with this tomorrow, with this chapter. But Bezor, have you got any idea how God is promising us with the good news, the good tidings, the gospel. He is promising us that even if the bride is taken in captivity, that David will find us all. Yeshua will, will recover and save. And Yeshua will, will recover and save and redeem us all. As long as we don't become willingly the whore. As long as we come out of the Babylon system and we stay faithful to him and we are captured somehow and you are tied down somehow and they force the mark of the beast inside your body. Now remember the mark of the beast eventually is going to end up being worship. Worship the image of the beast. But only this human race that's going to be ending up so genetically modified, so artificially intelligently designed that they will be like the Bible says, unable to be saved any longer. So the injection is not the ultimate mark of the beast. These are the building bricks with which they will form the eventual mark that, that will be the worship of the beast himself. But when the bride that has been going through the wilderness Ma'on and Zif stays true to Yeshua, even if it means our own ridicule in the eyes of the world, our own running away in the caves and leaving, losing everything that we had, leaving everything behind. The Bezora, because they came to the brook called Bezor. The Bezora, because in Hebrew, Bezorah means the flesh. 
The word Bezora is the word that is used for gospel. The gospel, the good news, will be preached to all the world so that people can be restored back to God through Yeshua. That is Yeshua. That is the Bezora. They come to the brook called Bezor. And if you go into the Hebrew of Bezor, it means cheerful. You know, the good news, cheerful news. And it is from the root word Basar. Basar means to be fresh, to be full, to announce glad or good news, to be a messenger of good news, to preach, to publish, to show forth, to bring good tidings. So this word Basar, that means the good tidings of which the gospel has been translated from Bezora, the good news, the glad tidings of Messiah Yeshua. That is the, that is the brook where they come to. They come to Besor, the good tidings. But Besor from the root word Bas. But Besor from the root word Basar has another meaning as well. If we look that um, in the book of Genesis, it says, And Adam knew his wife, and they became one flesh. In the Hebrew, that is Basar Echad. They became one Basar, one body, one flesh. It has been translated as flesh, but it actually means good news. And here it's been used as flesh. And the flesh of Yeshua is the good news. The Basar, the Bezora is the gospel. But what is the gospel about? The flesh of Yeshua was torn. Like the um, veil in the tabernacle was torn. The blood had to be spilt. The bitter cup was drunk by him. His, Yahuwah's word became flesh. The good news of the living word is Basar Chaim Dabar. And that is the gospel. That is the bazaar, the good news of the living word that became flesh. And this is the, the promise I have. When we preach the gospel, when we understand the bazaar, the bazora, even in the, the moment where we cried so much, we have no more power to weep like David and his men. And we come to the brook Besor, we know it's going to work out. Even if the bride is captured, and even if she does get raped, in the prison system or something. I don't know what, what's lying ahead for everyone. I just wanted to know from Yahuwah, what if we cannot fight with our hands tight, a, 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 hands tight a, 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 behind our, our backs and they inject all of these things inside of you and they chip you with all of these chips and you can't stop it because you can't fight and you are trying to roll around but they even tie up your body and they put your your head in a tie down and there's just nothing else you can do but pray somehow this cycle in the declaring of God who declares the end out of the beginning somehow in this prophetic ancient historical writings of 1 Samuel 30 verse 9 uh, uh, verse 8 and 9 God says don't worry all of them that has been taken captured will be recovered you just come down to Besor to the good news to the gospel you trust in to the gospel you trust in Yeshua the Basar the flesh of the good news you remain faithful to him. You obey Yahuwah and, and have the testimony, the basar, the good news of Yeshua. You understand the prophecy of Yeshua in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but also Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, everything we are studying. Because these will be the saints in the end day. 
against whom the dragon, the Amalekites, will be fighting and pursuing. But God will bring us through the tribulation like we saw two or three sessions ago. Not out of it, but through it. And we will, in our flesh as well, be risen, incorruptible, incorruptible, and we will see him eye to eye. We will be recovered to him. We will be restored to him. We are not going to lose our salvation as long as, we not, as long as we don't lose our faith in him. And your faith in him means you'll keep on fighting the good battle, spreading the good news, fighting the end day Amalekites up to the point of death. Don't care. And even if they somehow start uh, with clever plans to get you raped by the New World Order system, even if they rape you fighting and screaming, then somehow Yeshua is going to recover you. But you, you have to be found screaming and fighting and shouting and praying all the way to, to that battle. Don't just give up. Because if you give up, give up. Because if you give up, then you belong as a wife to the Amalekites. Then David is not going to recover you. But we trust in him. And we are going to be ready, even if we are captured. And it looks like there is no more hope. So we come to the brook called Besor. We come to Yeshua, who says in Matthew 11 verse 8, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we go through this whole end day battle journey. And we find ourselves at the living waters of the brook called Besor. The good news. And we come to Yeshua. The good news. The flesh. The word of God in the flesh. And he will give us rest. Even when we are screaming in battle. In our hearts we, we know the basar. The basar. We know the message of the Bezora, the message of the gospel, and we will have rest. You will have peace that will surpass all understanding, even in the eye of the storm, in the height of the battle, in the burning of the fire, and in the worst persecution.